I recognize about a quarter of the people here. That's a good thing. Uh, mostly because I teach at DePaul University. Um, I am, like Judy said, a user experience lead at ISOVAR. I've been there about four years now, and I've been in the field for about eight or nine. Um, I started teaching at DePaul around two and a half years ago, and uh, this will be my last term taking a break from teaching for a while, as much as I love all you guys that came. <laughs> it's fun having two jobs. Um, my contact info is right here, should you want to reach me. Uh, a little administrivia of what we're going to cover tonight. Um, don't feel like you have to run and scratch things down too fast or whatever. If you see anything interesting on the slide, you can download them right here, this is, uh, URL. That URL will be up again at the end of the presentation on my question slide, so you'll have plenty of time to write it down. What we're going to cover tonight basically are uh, broken this presentation into about three areas. Um, the difference between concepting activities and conceptual design as a whole, or as a phase. I'll go through some sample artifacts of work that I've done before, uh, at least that which I can show you, get to that when I talk about it. Um, and then just five ways that you can make a habit of integrating concepting into your everyday activities that work with you and your team. So how I got here and what I do. Um, I've been uh, living in Chicago now for about eight years. I came, by, uh, I came here actually for a job. I'd always wanted to work in the software field. And I decided out of college that working in a hospital in a small town in Michigan wasn't really the career path that I wanted. You know, uh, nothing wrong with that if that's what you want to do. But uh, it wasn't for me, so I took a job here in Chicago that brought me into working in uh, what was once a startup that then got acquired and then got uh, sunk into a giant corporate conglomerate. So um, the life cycle of a company there. Um, I was uh, with them around the transition uh, when they went from startup to corporate entity, and I got to witness a lot of fun about agile software development and the transition that goes from switching from waterfall to agile um, firsthand. Learned a lot, uh, even if it was um, uh, painful, <laughs> shall we say. I went to DePaul, which is um, a great school. They have a great user experience program there, uh, human-computer interaction, master's degree. Um, I recommend it. If you have questions about it, let me know. Uh, obviously, they asked me to teach there, so it's full of very wise people that you should listen to. <laughs> um, and then about four years ago, I started working for a company called Isobar, which was called Roundarch when I joined. Uh, I was acquired by... Again, I have this habit of joining companies right before they get acquired by someone much larger. Um, they were acquired by um, an uh, advertising and media network called Dentsu. You may have heard of them. So we're part of that global network. And I have spent the last about three and a half, three, three and a half years working for um, the Air Force, uh, which um, doing a lot of data-heavy applications, business applications, workflow-driven software. So when Judy is talking about uh, my previous presentation here, um, I, got, I, got, I went into that a little bit more. It has nothing to do with uh, tonight's lecture, though, so I'll kind of... Uh, did I just say lecture in front of a... <laughs> used to teaching. So <laughs> um, I can't believe I just dropped lecture in front of, like, a, a meetup group. This is, this is a little less formal, so... So uh, these two guys are running in the woods, right? And, uh, and, and they're, they're running away from a bear. Um, and one of them stops to uh, tie his shoe so he can tighten him up. And the, uh, the bear is catching up to them, and the other guy is like, what are you doing, don't you know? 
you know, the bear will stop at nothing until it gets something to eat. It'll kill one of us. And the guy said, that's exactly my point. That's why I'm tying my shoes, because I just need to outrun you. <laughs> um, that joke is from the movie The Imitation Game, uh, which is uh, about the work of Alan Turing, one of the pioneers of, of our field in technology. Um, so why are we here right now? Of course, uh, technology is uh, blowing up. And I read, a, I read in Forbes over the weekend that I think uh, even futurists are having a difficult time predicting the acceleration of the future. We have um, self-driving cars that are a couple years away. We have uh, um, all kinds of crazy technology like holograms that we're going to wear on our face. You know, um, I'm I'm here because I like to talk about uh, technology and I'm passionate about it. And I'm really passionate about creating work that makes technology easy to use for people who really don't give two shits about technology. Um, like my, well, my dad does, but anyway. Specifically, why are we talking about concepting, though, and conceptual design? Um, I think there's a lot that we can learn from taking conceptual design practices and applying them more broadly into the full software development life cycle. So if you're a developer or a designer, you might be able to pick something useful up out of this talk, hopefully. Um, so maybe your meetings feel like this. Um, if you're taking my class at DePaul, you might recognize some of the slides from tonight. So this is just a picture that I like to show that this is people collaborating in the Brazilian Senate in 1888. Um, people like to talk. People like to share their opinion. People have egos. There's a lot of challenges um, around that. Um, maybe your workday feels like this, like you're in a factory, like you're sludging around putting together work that you feel like has to have some kind of meaning, but you don't quite know how, or you wish that it could be more impactful than it is. Or your coworkers just make you want to do this all the time. <laughs> Let's watch that one more time. It's <laughs> great. He's talking to data, so he's actually talking to a computer on the other side of the camera. So. What, I, what my hope is that you think everything that I'm about to show you in, in this slide deck is painfully obvious. Because if you think it's painfully obvious, then that means that you probably have a good work environment already, and you're probably collaborating with your team, and you're synced up, and you're on the same page. And that's awesome. So maybe tonight I'll give you a couple buzzwords that you can go Google, or some really fun GIFs that you can download, if nothing else. Um, but I have uh, a few like ideas floating around that maybe because you're here and you want to learn about concepting and, and how you can integrate it, maybe you really want to learn something and maybe the world isn't such you know unicorns and rainbows right now for you. So um, hopefully this can, this can help um, what I'm about to talk about and hopefully you can have some good takeaways. Uh, worst case scenario, you'll meet some cool people and uh, that's, that's about it. So, um, what is conceptual design, right? And I mean, you, there's a couple different ways. When someone says conceptual design, I instantly think of um, a hipster wearing like uh, tight jeans and a plaid shirt and big glasses and a beard talking about, I just described myself. Um, <laughs> so talking about pretentious designery things. <clears throat> I'm gonna avoid making too many cliches tonight, but they, they are in here and they abound. So maybe conceptual design is a pretentious hippy-dippy activity that leads to a bunch of BS with a little tangible benefit. Maybe if you're a developer that's never really worked with designers, that's your opinion of, of what it means when you see a bunch of people with sticky notes all over the wall and you're like, what the hell are they doing? Hopefully we can help that, uh, show you what we're doing. Uh, if you're a business person, you might think conceptual design is a really effective way to collaborate that bridges knowledge gaps and creates new insights, right? You like to use a lot of buzzwords like that, and you like to you know, think of things as having value add and ROI. So sure, that's your definition. That'll work for you. Uh, finally, it's my four sort of definition. <laughs> uh, it's a super fun way for you and your team to work together so you can make cool shit. You know, um, that's what I like to do. So I like to try to, at least. Um, so. Conceptual design is a phase in a project that typically precedes more detailed design, um, more technical build-out of a product. 
it's when you strategize and you figure out what the product's going to be and you document it. And I'll show you some of the activities and the artifacts that you get from that. But concepting, which is not an actual word <laughs> yet, unless we want to make it one. Um, I've underlined it in red here because uh, as I was typing out the slides for the deck tonight, concepting was repeatedly changed to conceptions over and over. I, I, I thought about babies the whole time I was, I was doing this. <laughs> Actually, my friends had, their, uh, had a baby last night, so congrats to them. Um, so I think of concepting as it's some methods that you can use to pull stuff out of your head and get people on the same page. There are, there are habits and practices that you can do, like sketching and prototyping and testing and really getting into the habit of things to get ideas out there and get people to understand them with you rather than just having an idea and showing it to someone and um, expecting a designer to be able to design something and an engineer to be able to build it um, and a PM to be able to manage it in such a way that it turns out to be a good product. So the activities that you know I want to show you here really are around getting um, getting your team on the same page so that everyone can be synced up and making the best work that they can. So I just dropped out three roles there, designer, engineer, and business. Um, the designer, of course, has the Helvetica font. The business has the Times New Roman and the engineer with their council fixed with font there. <laughs> You're into typography. <coughs> The glasses speak for themselves. I couldn't find a, a, gla a pair of glasses on the noun project that had the tape down the middle for the engineer, so <laughs> I, I settled the closest that I could find. But what I want you to, uh, what I want you to think of here is that this is a real team sport. Okay, this is uh, one of three one of three things that you need to keep in mind is it's a team sport. Uh, these activities on the, on their own, sure, sketching is great for you or throwing some post-its up on the wall is great for you if you're working through a problem by yourself, but it's amplified and it's so much better when it's your whole team working together. And when I say team, I'm talking about like a product team, by the way, like maybe three to six or seven people, like a sprint team. Uh, if you're in a, if you're in the software development, you might have like six or seven people that work on a sprint team together. Next, concepting can fit into your workflow. So I've done these activities and, and have learned through, um, uh, worked through these in, in many different ways. Um, like I said, I started out working in an agile, or excuse me, in a waterfall environment, which is where you have a chunk of functionality, for those that aren't familiar, a chunk of functionality such as building something in the red there, uh, you work on just that piece of the project. Uh, so that's just the requirement <coughs> specification, we'll say. And then you go into the second week or the second month or the second year. <laughs> and you start doing just the, all of the design work together. And then finally, the, the third phase, the third you know, week, month, whatever, your developers come on and they start building it. Um, those should really say month and not week on that slide on the left. The... Uh, Agile process, quick overview, involves splitting up the work that you would do across a huge project into manageable chunks. So you end up doing the requirements, the design, and the code for a chunk of functionality in a compressed time frame. And then you move on, shift that, and move on to the next thing. So. Um, I'm not here tonight to talk about Agile or Waterfall or software lifecycle methodology, so this isn't uh, my area of expertise, but just at a high-level overview, you can integrate conceptual design activities throughout the project, um, throughout, uh, throughout the time that you're working on something. Finally, um, concepting really is what you make of it. So there's a lot of different tools and a lot of different methods out there that you can, um, that you can use to uh, to get ideas out there and get your team on board. I've picked a few things that I am a big fan of myself um, to talk about. I 
however, know that there are other things out here that I'm leaving out. So I don't intend this to be a, uh, a totally holistic overview of everything that you need to know. Um, there's far smarter people than me that have written books on this topic. So, familiar with the um, movie Gone Gary Glenworth, anyone? Yeah? Always be closing, Alec Baldwin's famous speech. I think he's only in the movie for like five minutes and he delivers this moment in cinema history. That is amazing. Um, always be closing. He's talking to a group of salespeople. So I'm talking to a group of designers and developers. You can see where this is going. Always be concepting. It's the magic of the iPad. We talk about how the iPad is more than a content consumption device. You can use it to create things. I created that. It's <laughs> magical and revolutionary right there. I actually would have, uh, could have drawn concepting just as well with my mouse as I did with my finger, which is interesting. Probably more telling of when I came up in technology than anything. So anyway, this guy's up here rambling on about hippy-dippy bullshit, right? So um, let's show some work. So this is, picture is taken at a um, design hackathon that I was part of back in September. Um, it's called Two Night Stand. And I don't see, is anyone here? Were you there with me at that? No? I don't think I saw anyone from there on the way in. Um, it was only about 25 people, and it's an invite-only thing, and, and you just are given a topic with no pretensions of it being um, for the greater good or for uh, anything touchy-feely. It's, it's, it's literally just make cool stuff. Um, so we tackled the future of transportation and automobiles specifically. So it was, a, it was a fun event. We got to sit in a Tesla and take pictures of us sitting in the Tesla but not actually driving it. Um, it, was, it was a really nice car, actually. So the, the joyous part about that event was it gave the people that were there work that we can like really show in public to show the process. Um, normally... I don't get to show in public how the sausage gets made, right? Uh, because when I'm working for like the Air Force, that requires security clearance, and I can't really show you the work from that. Although if you take my class, there's just enough to scare you in it. So um, you can cut that out of the video, right? Um, <clears throat> so that was a joke. Um, the first artifact here is a project wall. So this is really simple. You make sketches, preferably on like half sheets of paper. It's a really great format for doing sketches on. And you get in a room with your team and you just make these sketches. And as you do them, you just sort of make a few and you stand up and you stick them to the wall somehow. Right? It's really simple. It's probably the simplest activity you can do here. Um, and then as you're talking and having discussions, you have something physical to point to you can actually point to an idea in a physical form and actually talk about it. Um, you talk about like combining ideas, and people say innovation comes from collaboration and combining different pieces of knowledge. It makes a really physical way that you can actually combine ideas because what we had done here and what you're seeing, I think that's my friend Amy doing, is um, sorting the wall out. We had bits of story. We had, like, if you... If you download the slides, you can see it a bit more clearly. But we had, like, a story that we started to write out. And we started to craft this narrative around our users out of just a few sentences that we put up there. Um, we had sketches for, like, features of the software, the, the app that we ended up designing, like, really early iterations. And things that we sketched there made it into the final prototype that we built for the project. Um, we had things like the um, the story, the UI. We had things like the flows, like like boxes and arrows of like you know, user gets in the car, they they plug in their phone, they see this thing, and we had all this documented there, and we could go through and um, you might hear this called an affinity wall. We sort them based on the affinity uh, that the items have together. So we would take all of the things that had to do with UI around the steering wheel and put them on the far right. 
and all of the things that have to do with purely story around a person and put them on the left. And then imagine in the middle we had things like pieces of UI that didn't have anything to do with the, with the steering wheel and the heads-up display towards the middle and maybe had a little narrative about it. And we, we, we could really physically see the outliers in all of our ideas. Because we, because we were sketching out, we sat down for about 20, 25 minutes quietly. I mean, that's another thing that you can do is you can sit down and sketch quietly without anyone talking and just sketch out your ideas, put them up, and, and then you can physically see everyone's ideas, and you can actually group them. And you can see where your ideas diverge, and you can see the outliers. So things like, I talked about the, the boxes and arrows flow that I actually drew and put up there. It really stood out as a different idea because it was the only thing like sort of floating up by itself. Eventually, we decided that idea was crap, and we just put it like way on the bottom of the thing, so it was just out of the way. But that was great because it was a different idea that wasn't quite right, so we just stuck it out of the way. Um, as we were assembling our UI for the prototype, we actually had the sketches up there on the wall. And as we're as we're um, you know sitting at the table, which would have been you know out this way from where the angle of the picture is, we're actually turning our heads and looking at our sticky notes and looking at our sketches as we're actually like coding stuff. And we didn't really write any real code. That's debatable. Um, <laughs> Uh, for the programmers in the room, when I say we didn't really write any real code, it's because we just wrote HTML and CSS. So we didn't actually write like JavaScript or anything fancy. Um, so we didn't. At, bottom line, we're sitting there and we're actually looking, and we can physically see it, like what we're working on. Um, and if I've said that over the last like five minutes repeatedly enough, I hope I've uh, gotten the point across that you can physically see it, right? Um, it's a really useful tool. Um, so another tool uh, would be collages or mood boards. More formally, they might be described as. Or if you want to get technical about it, style tiles. It's where you just assemble um, the different visual inspiration that you have or the different UI elements that you're developing onto like a single board so that you can see them all together. Uh, sometimes when I'm designing um, a wireframe, uh, just like a wireframe of, a, of an app or a website, I'll go to what's called a sticker sheet, which is just a, a sheet of UI elements all like just in a grid on the page, and I can pick and choose the things that I like. This happens to be, I think this is a screenshot of Pinterest maybe, or, or it came, we, we were using Pinterest to actually pin the things around the web that we found interesting. So we had this activity where as a team we just sat there and we went around the web and we pinned to a, to a Pinterest board all the things that we found interesting. This is not original work that you're seeing in the individual items. It, as a whole, taken collectively as a collage, it is an original piece of work. Um, we didn't draw this picture or we didn't design those icons, et cetera, but we took inspiration from it. Um, these things are really useful because as you're a team and you're working together, you have a common thing to say. There's a couple different styles of typography going on here. Maybe we should do something that's more like the one in the bottom left and less like the one that's right above it. Definitely not the thing that's in the middle, right? Um, <clears throat> same thing goes. Uh, a lot of these artifacts can be seen in different phases throughout the project. Like I mentioned and I have up there, style tiles are a, a way to document for <coughs> responsive web design, um, how your UI components are going to be affected at the different breakpoints of the screen size. You can just lay out all of your um, all of your UI on the same page together and actually see uh, how the styles are applied at the different breakpoints and, and manipulate it all in one page. Um, pretty useful, uh, I've found. One of my favorites is storyboards. I make storyboards like they're my job, because it actually is. Um, I sketched out this basic e-commerce flow here of Amazon. It's a multi-device experience from shopping online. Just as something to show when I talk about this, uh, that I didn't actually build Amazon.com, thank God. <laughs> so. 
raise your hand if you can roughly tell with my chicken scratch what's going on here. You have a basic idea, right? You can see it. You can see that it's a person sitting at a computer doing something on the website, and then they get a confirmation that their order was placed, and then they get a push notification that's on their phone. They're looking at their phone, and they see that on their phone that their order is out for delivery. It's a, it's a really simple experience we take for granted nowadays. It was super futuristic maybe 10 years ago that this idea that you would get, I guess at the time, would have been an SMS text message when your shipment went out from Amazon. The bottom line is you can do sketches like this that show a process and show multiple devices that the user interacts with all on the same page. Um, we do this a lot at work when we're talking about um, to talk about uh, some of my work for the Air Force, I can't show you, but it's a very complex uh, set of applications that we have to that we have to deal with and, and systems that are integrating together and everything. And we have to um, basically make to understand and to document um, the complexity of their day-to-day -day work. We have to make comic strips effectively showing the different screens and showing with, uh, it'd be so much easier if I could show you, um, <laughs> showing, uh, like, imagine a screen of, like, six blocks, and each one of them has, maybe there's three different users that are involved in it, and we would put little comic people down in the corners that are color-coded to indicate who's doing what. That way, when we hand that deliverable off to a developer, the developer understands our thinking around their uh, the client's workflow. Um, doing these kind of activities and showing it to a client like that is also super beneficial for them because them seeing it, how you see it as an outsider, is incredibly helpful. All through, like, basically comic book style mock-ups, lo-fi wireframes and, and storyboards. Um, paper prototypes are um, really effective. I have a lot of fun with these. This is one um, that I made <coughs> with a coworker. We were trying to explain a very, I guess you would call it iPad-like interaction of panels sliding around. So I took out the sound because it's talking about really specific business rules and stuff that don't matter for demonstrating the idea. But you click on a link and a panel slides in. And you're done looking at this, and the panel slides out. This is on a web app, by the way. This is not an iPad. And then we go back to the original state there. Trying to describe, and I'll, I'll get to this in a minute, trying to describe that interaction over email or in a JIRA ticket about how when you compress the screen to a certain size and you can't see all three panels at the same time, um, you need to only show two when you need them to move in and out at a certain with a certain style of animation and have it slide around in a certain way that's very important. Trying to do that over email or like in a, in a JIRA ticket in a, if you're using like a, a agile tracker is super challenging. Um, and the developer said that um, it was a contractor that we hired to, to work on this piece said that he's never had anyone do this with him before. Um, like actually take the two minutes that it took to make this and record it with an iPhone and attach it to the JIRA ticket. He would never in his career um, had anyone do that with him. And this guy was like probably 40 or something. Um, it was a totally new idea to him. And he's like, thank you so much for just taking the time to describe it like that because he had it coded completely wrong apparently when he did his first pass. So... Um, we made this in like 2012, 2011, when the iPad was fairly new and people hadn't really, not everyone had gotten used to those kinds of interactions. Um, another deliverable that I'm a huge fan of, because I like writing, are persona stories. I never make a persona that has the, the typical layout with a picture of the user, their, their age, and you know, we all have this idea of like what a persona looks like. 
and I've never found those kind of personas useful for my work. Maybe they're useful for marketers or for people in other fields, but they're not for me. Um, the things that I've always found useful for my team are writing an actual narrative, like sitting down with your team, developers, designers, business people all together. Actually, business people are, think this is really fun because they like live in Microsoft Word all day and Microsoft Office, so they really get a kick out of this. Um, it's like something that they can play with. <laughs> um, you're just sitting there and you're like, as you're talking about a user and their path through an application and their experience through like some of the, the other artifacts that I showed you, um, as you're doing that, you, you start to formalize it. It starts to go from a really fuzzy, weird area where people have just thrown a bunch of stuff on a wall and organized it through to actually making sense of it. You have a story that you can actually read, and if you download the slides, it's actually legible and you can, you can read it. So this is probably too small to read from the back at least. One of the things that you'll see in here are pieces of text that are highlighted. Does anyone want to guess what those are? <coughs> no? Stories? Interruption? Transition? Interruption? <laughs> Couple things. There's two things going on there. One is they are, thank you, Chris, they're, they map to the user stories or the actual things that we had sketched out and put on the wall. Um, the other are... Um, uh, the other uh, thing that they are is they are interactions on the screen with the app. So they're the same, yeah, same, same thing. What's your name? Gloria. Gloria, thank you, Gloria. Yeah. I already know that guy. So. Um, super fun to do. It's a fun activity. It doesn't take long. It took like two hours to write that. And for the benefit that we actually had as a team after we had gone through the exercise of writing this out um, was way beyond beneficial. Um, Way, outweighed the two hours it took to do that together. Um, finally, this is a pretty common one as far as conceptual design goes or design in general. It's a, it's a brief, it's a slide deck like what you're seeing me here, but it's all laid out together. These are individual slides. Um, <coughs> you sort of take those chunks of the application um, that you had sketched out and you, you make mock-ups of them and you take those uh, stories that you had written and you Put them along so that the, as someone's reading through the screens, they can follow. The, they can follow along. You could also consider this to be like an annotated wireframe deck, but it's less specific than that. These are really great when you have to give a client briefing, like actually walk a client through them, um, and the client has the goal of passing the work along to someone else. Um, if you're not working in a consulting environment or in an environment where um, your work gets handed off a lot, it's probably less useful to go through the formality of putting this together, but in those cases where the client has to take your work and then sell someone else on it on your behalf, it's like it makes up for it and leaps and bounds the, the couple of days that you might take to actually put something more formal like this together. It's worth noting this also came from the... Um, the two night stand activity. It was it was two nights, so it was like Friday night, Saturday during the day, and Sunday half a day. Um, we did what would normally be done over the course of at least a week in two and a half days. So we didn't have you know, and then I went to work the next day. <laughs> so I didn't really have a weekend that weekend, but it was fun. So yeah. A lot of people hate the idea of putting decks together like this. Um, I happen to uh, hate it too. I actually, um, I once at one point sat down with my boss a few years ago and, and said how I, I hope I never have a job where I have to like make PowerPoint decks all day. And then I started teaching. <laughs> Here I am at a meetup giving a talk. I still hate making slide decks, but it's something you have to do sometimes. So I avoid making them at all costs. Just to say, this is coming from a guy who avoids making slide decks at all costs. Um, so how do you make a habit out of this kind of stuff, right? So we have, I guess we started a little, a little later than six. Um, how do you make a habit out of delivering work like that? Like 
doing these kinds of activities in your day to day. That was the title of the talk. And the fun part about doing the title of a talk before you actually write the talk is that you really actually have to come up with something <laughs> to, as, a, as a strong takeaway. So my takeaway to you uh, basically tonight are hopefully five things that you can do that are useful. So one of the problems we all face that I know I face a lot is jumping to conclusions. Like just coming to the conclusion that a certain piece of functionality should work a certain way. Or we did it this way before, and I know how to do this. This is the same problem. I'm going to solve it the same way again. It's really easy to get into the habit of doing that. And the next few things, uh, which are totally not clever inventions at all, are ways to avoid jumping to conclusions. And that involves collaborating super fast, really often, and visually so that everyone can see it. So if you want to avoid just saying, you know, we did, we did this way before. I've made a responsive website before. I know how to do a marketing page for a product that has a price and has a bulleted list of this and that and the other thing on it. I've seen Amazon. Um, get a bunch of people in a room while you're working on this and just sketch stuff all the time, really fast, really rough, and make sure that everyone sees it. Because if you want to push the envelope and not do the same thing over and over again, and you want to get your team on board with, uh, you know, okay, guys, let's not take, um, you know, the product details for this um, sweater and put height, you know, recommended for people of this height, five foot to six foot, you know, uh, waist size, this size to this size, and a bulleted list, like actually sit there and try to sketch out. Here's a big fat guy with a belt around him. You know, I can say that because I have a few extra pounds. Um, another thing that we all avoid are experts, or we want to avoid, <laughs> that we often can't avoid, are people that come in like they want to just like run the show and Sometimes they really are experts. My point in using, um, this is actually not office space. <laughs> this is, um, <laughs> that's funny, I forgot to change that. It's Pulp Fiction, yeah. Um, yes, so there's a scene in the movie where they accidentally kill a guy in the car, and they have to get rid of the guy in the car, um, and it's full of blood. They're covered in blood. What are you going to do? Um, you go to Quentin Tarantino's house and have his coffee, you know? So the guy truly is an expert here, right? He knows how to dispose of a body and how to clean a car. Um, but the point is, sometimes you there's a more creative way that you could do something, you know? I mean, we've seen Breaking Bad. We know that you can melt someone in acid if you have the right kind of uh, plastic top to put them in. You don't need to do what they did in here, Right? Come on, I mean, you wouldn't be able to come up with that situation if you just listened to the expert that wants to dispose of them in the traditional way. That's why Mike died in Breaking Bad, right? Anyway, <laughs> um, I have a problem with pop culture references, if you can't tell. So how do you marginalize experts? You get your team so used to the fact that you're going to talk about everything and talk everything through that it just becomes accepted that you're going to sit there and debate the minutia and the finer details about every single thing. I can't tell you how many times I have sat in a room with my team uh, and debated the points of how a calendar selector should work. So like anyone who's taken my class, there's a few people smiling, know that I like go back to this example all the time. And it's because we would debate how a time selector works endlessly because it has to work with quarters and years and, and fiscal years and fiscal quarters and date ranges that include data that's bad and date ranges that include data that was calculated one way and data that was calculated another and just endless debates about how these things should work. We would never take for granted the fact that we could go onto the internet and find like jquery.calendar.js or whatever and use it. Anything that we would have to do would 
definitely be better served by coming up with a really heavily debated solution. <clears throat> the other part about this that I say GTFO the office is two things. <coughs> One way to marginalize experts is to get them drunk and make them your friend. <laughs> okay. The other way is to get out of your own office and actually think about people in the real world. And that's really what this symbolizes, is not to, to marginalize the other one. Um, <coughs> getting out of the office and, and, and you know, actually seeing how people interact with these pieces of functionality is incredibly important. And it will make even the most staunch person who thinks they're an expert on a topic um, question their belief, right? Um, I worked at a healthcare company once. Um, it was a startup that I was telling you about, who was led by, uh, started by a doctor, an incredibly smart man, um, and staffed by a bunch of nurses and uh, at least one other doctor, who thought that I just wouldn't say it that way because they were really smart people who, with the best intentions, believed that what they were doing and the way they were designing their software was the best thing. But me as a support team member, someone who had to actually go on a client visit to install software and to like guide the client through their upgrades, saw how other doctors and nurses were using the software and how it wasn't quite fitting right for them. Um, getting out of the office and seeing that um, is so important because I remember at one point, um, I would always hear about how some of these people who um, were, you know, like, you know, there was this other doctor that worked at the company um, who I went on a site visit like that with. And she would always come back with these site visions with, from these site visits with grand ideas about figuring out these solutions and, and how something should work. Um, and I was really fortunate to get to go on one with her and actually sit there and see how she was talking to the people and understand what they were doing because me, the, the budding interaction designer, um, would say, well, really... Sometimes the most creative and crazy idea isn't the best. Uh, you know, we don't need to do this grand, huge redesign because all they really need you to do is to change this label from this to that, or you have two things that are red on the screen at the same time and they both mean different things. Small things like that. So sometimes just bringing in an outside perspective um, and using it as evidence is incredibly important. That's the key thing there. It's, it's, it's the basics of user research, right? You you get out there and you collect objective evidence and apply your own expertise to it and then you can cite it whenever you want. We did user research for the Air Force three years ago and we still cite it because it was so effective. That's how we justify spending 40 hours of billable work on a time picker. <laughs> so, it's, God, the time that we spent on that time picker was more than 40 hours. <laughs> Um, silos. Has anyone seen the show Dexter? Yeah, okay. There was, an, there was a season that wasn't so good, and this is from that, but it's the only, when I thought of silo, I instantly thought of like the dead guy that Dexter stored in the silo. So I had to use it. Silos um, really do uh, cause problems, because you have this idea that here's one person and they're a developer and here's another person and they're a designer. This is the classic problem, right? They don't understand each other and they, 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 um, they don't get why each other is so, uh, you know, like a designer might not understand why a developer is so dead set on doing something has to be, you know, I really want it to work this way and the designer says, but if the user really wants it to work this way, um, but what they're really trying to solve is the same thing. Like, they're, they're both trying to solve for the most elegant solution that they can. And um, breaking down those silos and working together is, uh, is incredibly uh, effective because you get to be better friends with your developer and have more empathy, you know, with them. Uh, and meanwhile, they, um, and you start to understand, okay, this system happens to work in this way. And, I can't design these crazy things that do this, that, and the other thing because the data that I'm dealing with and, the, and all the other factors that play into it uh, work a certain way. And that helps you to design something more effectively. So 
how do you how do you get in the habit of of getting on that same page? And, and this is straight out of like Agile and Lean 101. You just sync up constantly and have an agenda, have a structure to it. Um, I have a twice weekly sync up with the other designers that I work with where we all get together and talk about the work that we're doing and the things that we're designing. And we show our work and it's a show and tell and we critique each other's work. Um, it's very not top down. Um, in fact, the people that talk the most in those meetings are probably the, the younger people uh, because they, they don't have as solid of an understanding. So they need to talk more to express their ideas. Um, typical agile software development uh, <coughs> setup, you'll have a, a daily meeting where every, every day you get together and you have a stand up. You, you talk about what you're going to work, what you worked on, what you're going to work on, and if you're blocked by anything. Um, cross-functionally, you can hear what everyone's talking about. And then that, that would be interdisciplinary, right, where it's designers, developers, and business all together. Another way to do it, and, and what, what my team does every two weeks, um, the broader team, is we all get together, um, everyone that's working on this one client that is working on different projects, and we all get together and we talk about the problems that we're hearing from the client. And we, we do this every, about every two weeks. If we did it more, more closer together than that, it probably wouldn't be as effective um, just because it'd be too, it would be less new information every time. Um, we do this so that, oh, you were going to ask them that question, weren't you? But you just said that you know the answer to it, so we don't even have to go to the client. We already know how something's going to look. Or you have situations where your mobile application and your responsive website end up being very closely aligned and having the same and very similar functionality. Um, it's not a completely different experience when you go mobile versus web that way. Um, that's how these, that, so not doing an activity like syncing up is how you end up with differences like um, because we didn't meet together and talk about this, we ended up with this, and even if you did meet together, it was done in a way that maybe it was over email or maybe it was over the phone when you really should have been in the room sketching together. Uncertainty. Luke Skywalker was really sure about himself <laughs> when he fired that first shot into the Death Star, but it didn't work, did it? Did I get that right? Is that how the movie actually went down, right? Yes, okay. And then use the force loop. Don't use the thing over your face, right? Um, so... Uncertainty is that feeling that you get when you're working on something and you say, I'm just going to go ahead and blaze through and do this. Well, probably the better thing to do would be to go ask someone else or to sort of do it part way and then test it with someone else and see how it works. So we like to prototype a lot. We make things on paper or whether analog or digital, way before we, we would ever think about building them in, um, in, an, in a waterfall uh, methodology where you're going from one phase of a project to another, you're going to have a conceptual design phase up front. But in a more agile environment, you don't have that conceptual phase necessarily up front every time. Um, so you have to integrate these practices throughout. So how do you do that? You end up prototyping and doing coming up with ideas very quickly on the fly throughout the process. Um, you make a prototype that's an icon of a 3D printer. By the way, all the icons that you're seeing on here are from the website The Noun Project. It's a great project um, started here in Chicago. Uh, <coughs> icons from people all around the world. Um, and my slides are actually citing the different, um, all the cool, all the people that created these icons that you're seeing. I didn't make them myself. so. Um, by enlisting testers, whether your coworkers, a client, um, using a service like usertesting.com, or going through like posting a posting on TaskRabbit to say you need people to come into your office and look at something, it works. You enlist testers, um, and people will use it, and they will find out what your problems are really quickly, and then you have that 
subjective evidence that you needed, things that you can't quantify as like, well, maybe that button shouldn't be there. Maybe it should be over here. You have that evidence that you can point to from real people who are outside of your team. Uh, and then inappropriate communication. Uh, anyone who's seen House of Cards knows a lot of that happens on that show. Um, I've only seen the uh, first season, so no spoilers. Um, people really like their email. It's probably the worst protocol for communication that we have ever encountered. Uh, it's horrible for organizing your thoughts in, uh, in a product setting. Um, and it won't go away. <laughs> Same thing with conference calls. There's a wonderful video about, uh, out there called Conference Call in Real Life. I'll spare you from showing it here. It's a great video. You should look it up. It's all about what a conference call would look like if you actually met those people in person. There's no way you would behave the way you do on a conference call if you were in person with those people, I guarantee it. So... How do you get around that? How do you do these uh, conceptual design activities in, uh, in a setting uh, where you can't be next to each other all the time? Of course, you use things like screen sharing and video chat. And you put everything in your tracker. Like if you're using um, Jira to manage your agile boards or uh, Pivotal Tracker is another one. There's a lot of software for doing it. Um, you can actually see visibly what your team is working on. You can see where your team needs to focus on because they have um, a, a lot of work to do or what they've completed. And you can go in like uh, with the paper prototype that I made and actually attach it to your tickets. I can't tell you how effective it is and how many minutes have been saved by taking screenshots, usually with Skitch, marking them up with some arrows and a couple words of text and attaching that to a ticket and assigning it to a developer and saying, this is what I was thinking, or making a quick paper prototype and recording it with your phone and showing it, you know, just putting it on a ticket so that as a developer is working on this uh, piece of functionality, they see it and they understand. Um, screen sharing is so useful that um, I don't know how I ever worked without it. I remember when I worked at the uh, healthcare software company that I was mentioning, we didn't hardly screen share at all. We knew we had the technology because we would remote into our client servers and actually be able to use their servers through uh, Windows Remote Desktop. But we would never actually use screen sharing technology too much with like one-on-one -on -one as we were troubleshooting something with a doctor or a nurse. Um, sure, there's patient confidentiality issues with that, but we already had access to their database of medical records anyway, so quite often actually we will have a mock-up of, um, of an application and be using Adobe InDesign or Axure uh, right in front of our client and showing them how the sausage is made um, so they can see it and see us go through the process. Uh, and the same thing with video chat. A lot of people don't like video chat, um, but it just adds another level of fidelity. Uh, people don't like video chat because uh, they don't like the idea that someone can see their face on a computer screen. <laughs> and I don't know what the issue is. I'm, that's just me, though. Um, I like using video chat with my coworkers. If nothing else, you can use uh, Skype or Google Hangouts audio only, and the call fidelity is infinitely better than a typical landline or cell phone. So those are my uh, five habits that I was hoping to share with you, some you know, things that you could do um, to enlist the conceptual design practices in your day-to-day -day activity. What just happened? <laughs> Wow. I didn't even touch anything. <laughs> that's, a, that's my conclusion, though. So <laughs> uh, concepting is the application of methods to pull ideas out of your head, uh, the outcome, you and your peers understanding uh, and believing in those ideas. 
habitually practicing them can like really lead to a better environment for you and your team to work in and better products for people to use. So um, I want to say thanks. Um, and here's a picture of a cat with a golden gun riding a unicorn that's breathing flames. Um, the link to the slides is at the bottom here. It's not very big and legible, but um, I'll come up and take a picture later. Um, that's my talk. Thanks for coming. All right, who has questions? Anyone? Come on, someone. It only takes one. How, how, what is the complexity of the paper animation? The complexity of the paper animations, how complex does it go? So what you saw up there was probably the most complex one that I made. There was actually, um, we taped a frame to a desk and actually had little poles with scotch tape so that we could move things around. Um, typically, it's not even that complicated. It's usually just taking a couple different states on a sketch and actually like clicking and then throwing something else on top of it. And just saying, like, OK, I'm going to tap that, okay, then this comes in, okay, and now I'm gonna, gonna do this, okay, that comes in. We usually don't get too complicated with, like, sometimes you'll see it or it'll be like, okay, now tap in that field, okay, take your pen and actually write your name in the field. Like, we don't, we don't get that complicated. Yeah. If I had anything to give you, I would, no. Anyone else? Yeah. This is a pretty ideal situation. Uh-huh. Um, any advice to people that don't agree with uh, this very extensive level of concepting? Right. So I would say if there's anything, um, so the, the question is, um, this is coming from an ideal state where you're able to practice all of these things and get your coworkers on board and everything. If you're working somewhere where it's less ideal, there's a few tips and tricks that you can practice in here that, uh, that you can take. If, if you're not doing um, screen sharing, you can start. Like, and that's typically a really low barrier to entry. Or the next time you go over to your coworker's desk, it was awkward for me the first few times I did this earlier on in my career, bring your notebook with you and actually sketch it out in front of them. You know, just like little things and just like, or like the culture of debate one, creating a culture of debate. Don't be the jerk that's in the room asking questions all the time and just being annoying. But like, try to do it in such a way that whenever you ask a question, it's super like thoughtful, and encourage other people to do the same and do it very slowly and gradually. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. You talked about putting concepting into your workflow mm -hmm. as an important step, but you didn't actually talk about how to do that. Oh yeah. So, uh, so what are some ways that people can actually integrate concepting into their day-to-day? So, right, so tactically, how do you actually integrate this stuff into your day-to-day -day workflow? I sort of like listed out a bunch of stuff, like here's different concepting artifacts, and then here's a few habits that you can get into for, for working, but like how does it actually fit in day-to-day? -day? I think the one example that I go to immediately was the idea of attaching your sketches and stuff to, uh, to your tracker tickets, like actually putting in um, your sketches or your screenshots um, in your in your tracker. Um, another thing would be for like if you if you want to like get people in the habit of writing and like writing stories um, like the persona <coughs> stories I showed, you could actually you know get on a, a shared Google Doc and um, and either over the phone or over Hangouts or something um, actually say, you know, we're talking about this right now. Hold on, let's let's take this up a level and actually like write this out as if, okay, Bob's the user and Bob's gonna go and he just got in, he has coffee Bob, Bob Bob just got in the morning and has his coffee and needs to run his reports. And he then you take one of your user stories from your tracker, copy paste it as a user, I want to, and you just put as Bob, I want to do this because blah. And you contextualize your user stories around a, a more narrative form. That would be one way. Yeah, cool. Bob's your uncle. Anything else? No? No? Going.
going once, going twice. Thank you. Thanks.